All right, let's open our Bibles to John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. Like I said, it's hard for us sometimes to get our attention off of the panic and different things that are going on around us, but as believers, we need to turn our eyes upon Jesus Christ. And so I want to encourage you tonight as we look here in John chapter number 1 about some things about the Lord and how great God good God is and how great Jesus Christ is. So look here in John chapter number 1. Very familiar passage. We'll read just the first few verses and get right into the message. Verse number 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this text. I pray that you'd help us, Lord, as we deal with things in our society. Lord, to turn our eyes to you for grace and for help. And God, we thank you that we have Jesus Christ as our personal Savior to give us the strength we need as we go through life. And God, we pray for our brethren all across the world that you might help them. We pray, God, that you'd help us, as was prayed earlier, to be a good witness and a good testimony during trials and times like this. We pray that you might bless our time in the Word tonight. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. If I made the statement tonight, Jesus Christ is, you would expect me to finish that statement. In other, in other words, Jesus Christ is good. Jesus Christ is my Savior. Um, if I were to say, I am, you would expect me to finish that statement. Now, Jesus makes the statement, I am, several times in the book of John, and he does finish the statement. He says this, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. John 10, I am the door of the sheep. John 10 again, I am the good shepherd. John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 15, 1, I am the true vine. Seven times Jesus makes that statement in John, I am, and then he fills it in. So tonight, just for a few minutes, only in the first chapter of John, I want us to look at the fact that Jesus Christ is... Jesus Christ is. Now, I don't think I have to give us a theology lesson. We understand the pre-existent nature of Christ. In other words, Jesus Christ is God. So Jesus Christ as God was pre-existent in the Godhead before He was born on the earth. Jesus Christ as a man was born about 2,000 years ago, but Jesus Christ has always existed. We notice here in the text, verse number 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Look down in verse 14. The Word was made flesh. So in the beginning was the Word, the Word is God. The Word was made flesh. In verse 14, that tells us that God became flesh. That's called the Incarnation. And so we understand this about Jesus Christ, but as a man, Jesus Christ is a man. He's 100% man. He's 100% God. He has to grow up. He has to learn. He has to learn how to read. He has to learn how to talk. He has to learn experiences, and he suffers. He's tempted with sin. He gets hungry. He gets thirsty. He gets tired. God can't get tired. God can't get hungry. He says over the book of Psalms, he goes, if, he goes, I, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. He goes, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. <laughs> Uh, God can't die. Jesus Christ died. 
So you understand the difference between the humanity of Christ and the deity of Christ. And so we want to understand some things about Jesus and we marvel and we should marvel at that. But I want us to look here in John chapter number 1, just real simple Bible study really tonight. Jesus Christ is, what is He? Look in verse number 4. Jesus Christ is the life. He is life. Look in verse number 4. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. I quoted the verse earlier in John 14, 6. We're all familiar with it. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so we all know that verse and we realize that. But when you think about life itself, Jesus Christ is the life. In the beginning was the Word. Without Him speaking life into existence, we would not have life. He is life. Colossians chapter number 3. The Bible says, uh, If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ, Christ dwelleth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on this earth. That's hard to do right now, isn't it? And you go in the grocery store and everything's empty. Man, I just want some steaks. I just want some ground beef. You know, where's the, the chicken noodle soup? I mean, it's empty. It's a weird time that we're living in and it's probably going to get stranger. And it's easy to get your affection set on things down here. You're like, man, I need my freezer full. I need my cabinets full. I need to watch out what is about to happen. I don't know what's about to happen. But really, as a Christian, my, my citizenship's in heaven, and I don't need to be so bogged down with this earth anyway. And so we need to keep the proper perspective. If we are heavenly minded, we will be earthly good, because we'll have the right kind of balance, and we'll have some sensibility about us. So when you think about that verse, he says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life was hid with Christ in God, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. You catch that phrase? When Christ, who is our life. Our life is Jesus Christ. Now, I gave that quote uh, Sunday about from Corrie ten Boom, the lady that was persecuted during the, um, the Nazi Holocaust, and they had harbored Jews, and so their family was taken, and she lost her sister at Ravensbrück and, and uh, the, the concentration camps and all that. And she made the statement that Jesus Christ is the best thing there is. So if you lose everything else, you still have the best thing. The most precious person and the most precious thing, if you want to, I'm not trying to be sacrilegious using that term, the most precious thing or him or object is Jesus Christ. You lose everything else, you still have the best thing. And so you want to keep that perspective. And so Jesus Christ is the life. Notice in verse number 3, He's the source of life. Psalm 100 verse number 3 says this, Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. You did not make yourself. I'm a self-made man. No, you're not. <laughs> God created you. Well, my mom and daddy made me. No. Nope. God gave life. God created us. And so he has to make this statement. It's a perfect verse for nowadays because people just go through life not even realizing God created them. Psalm 100 verse 3, Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us and not we ourselves. And so when you look at this verse here in John 1, He's the source of our life. And then He's also the sustenance of our life. He sustains us. Colossians 1 verse 17, the Bible says, He is before all things and before... Before hell was, heaven was. Before the earth was, heaven was. Before the devil was, Jesus was. He's before all things. And he'll be here when all things are done. But he says this, he is before all things and by him all things consist. It says over the book of Hebrews, he holds all things together by the word of his power. The physicists, they don't understand how these electrons and everything stay together because theoretically they should just all spin apart. You know, you study in astronomy and the scientists think they have it all figured out. You know, this thing's spinning around this and this thing's spinning around this. They'll look at one thing. You have uh, the earth will be spinning this way and one, another planet will be going in the opposite direction. Now, how come if everything is, is gravitational and it's all going around, the sun just spun everything out in this big cosmic mush that just evolved, how come it's not all spinning in the same direction? That doesn't make sense. 
The, when they study atoms, they call what they have what's called the gluon. They don't even know what it is. What holds the atoms together? I'll tell you what's holding it or who's holding it together. God's holding the stuff together. Amen. And He's holding it together by the word of His power. And when He says, boo, it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow. And so you want to understand that He is the sustainer of life. And that's good for us to keep in perspective at this point. Um, look, I'm not telling you to be careless. I believe you ought to follow certain guidelines and you need to try to you know, do the things that the authorities are telling us to do to be safe. Obviously that. We've given recommendations to our church members, different things about staying away and in in, in those kind of things. But you have to realize our life is in God's hands. There are places where doctors do everything they can do and... It's in God's hands. It's been in God's hands from the beginning. And so you have to realize the sustenance of our life is in His hands, and then the satisfaction of life is also in, in His hands. In other words, you are satisfied in life as a believer when you find that fulfillment of life in serving Jesus Christ. And you will not find fulfillment outside of Jesus Christ. That's why the most prosperous country in the world, America... And some of the other countries that are very prosperous have some of the highest suicide rates in the world. Pleasure and prosperity do not bring fulfillment. They bring an emptiness. There's an emptiness inside people because there's an empty spot where God's supposed to be. And when God is not in that empty spot, you try to fill it with all these things. There's, there's one good thing that's come out of this, this epidemic, this pandemic. You say, what's that? They shut down the bars. Right. Amen! Amen! It's a sad day in America when it takes some pandemic to shut down the bars and get the people to quit drinking. That's a sad thing. Praise the Lord, at least they tell them, hey, you don't need to be getting, we don't need people off work going around getting drunk 24 hours a day. You know, going to the beaches and getting drunk and all this stuff. We could have told you that a long time ago. <laughs> but you know, when you think about people trying to fill the void in their life with pleasure and with money, and with prosperity, and with the next new gimmick that comes out. All these kind of things, it's a sad state of affairs. Only Jesus Christ fulfills the emptiness that you find in your life. Philippians 1.21, Paul said this, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For to me to live is Christ. Somebody said this, Life heav Life's heaviest burden is having nothing to carry. God has all of us here for a purpose. And your job as a believer in Jesus Christ is number one, be a believer. Don't doubt Him. Believe Him. Have faith. Trust Him. But as a believer, that means God's got you here to touch somebody else's life. Be an example. To be a testimony. To be a witness. And God has a burden on you for a purpose. And you don't want to miss that. Jesus Christ is the life. Look in verse number 4 also. Jesus Christ is the light. He's the light of men. Notice also in verse number 9. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. You know, I believe men reject Christ. They reject light. It's like closing their eyes when the sun's real bright. There's light in the world for people to know there is a God. You have to be educated out of the natural belief that God created all of this. And He is the light. John chapter 9 verse 5, Jesus said, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. In John 8 He said this, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Look over in chapter 3. I told you I'd stay in chapter 1, but I apologize. Look in chapter 3. Most of us are familiar with verse 16, but look later down from verse 16 and verse 19. John 3, 19. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. You ever clean the house? Then you say, oh, I'm going to open up these blinds. <laughs> and you open up the curtains, open up the blinds, and you're like, man, where'd all this dust come from? <laughs> Well, you couldn't see it. And you can't see it unless it's exposed. And that's why people don't like light, because they don't want to be exposed. People would rather cover up 
He that covereth his sins, the Bible says, shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall find mercy. So you want to make sure you understand that Christ is the light, and re the reason people do not want the light is because they are rebelling against it because of their nature. Light exposes. It exposes the problem. But here's the difference in, in God and the devil. The devil will expose sin in someone's life to make them feel bad, to condemn them. The Holy Spirit will expose sin in someone's life to make them feel bad. And by the way, your conscience is there for a reason. God pricks you with that conscience to make you feel bad when you do wrong. But He always does that to show you there's forgiveness. And you can come back to Christ and get help and there's hope in Jesus Christ. That's the difference in God and the devil. The devil just condemns, Christ forgives. But that light, it exposes sin. And so, Jesus Christ is the light, the comprehension of darkness. You see that in verse number 5. The light shineth in darkness, the darkness comprehendeth it not. The darkness says, we don't want the truth. We don't want to hear the truth. The darkness says, you know, I, I just don't want to hear that. And it comes up with all kinds of excuses. The Bible says, the fool have said in his heart, there is no God. The Bible talks about a man in Proverbs 16. If you read your proverb of the day, it talks about a man seeketh and uh, he separateth himself. And he does that to seek and intermeddle with all wisdom. The fool hath no understanding and knowledge, but that his heart may discover itself. A fool says, I'm going to get around and I just want to discover myself and have philosophies of men and wisdom of men and, and shut God out because the problem is in the heart, it's not in the head. The darkness comprehendeth it not. The reason people can't intellectually understand the gospel is because they're not willing in their heart to admit that they've sinned. The darkness comprehendeth it not. But notice the comparison of the light of Jesus Christ with the dimness of someone like John, verses 6 through 8. They think John is the Messiah. You know the story. John's like, look, I'm just the voice crying in the wilderness. And it says here in verse number 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. He was not that light, verse 8, but was sent to bear witness of the light. John is nothing compared to Jesus. Now John's a great man. Jesus said, of, of men born of women, there have not risen a greater than John the Baptist. I'm thinking, who, you know, how, what other way are men born, you know? <laughs> of men born of women, okay? What he's saying is there's nobody greater than John the Baptist. And that's a great compliment, but John is nothing compared to Jesus. You ever think about these lights and how bright they are sometimes? And maybe you have the new LED lights or they have some super bright uh, flashlights you can get now, which is really great. And uh, some of these new cars, these guys get these crazy lights, man, almost run you off the road. And you think about how bright they are, but if you get a bright sunny day and you take the brightest light man can come up with, it's nothing compared to the sun. You take the best man has, it's nothing compared to the glory of God. Nothing. And so Jesus Christ is the light. And that song we sang, Amazing Grace, I once was blind, but now I see the idea of light flooding into the darkness. And we can take our mind's eye, we can go back to the creation. You know, God said in that darkness, He said, let there be light. And there was light. You know, when you get saved, the Lord turns the light bulb on. And you begin to see things. You see yourself in a different perspective. You begin to see the Lord in the correct perspective. You even see others in the right perspective. Instead of being critical, now you're compassionate. Instead of being condemning, now you're caring. Because you begin to see through His eye, there's some light. And God gives you some light. The Bible says, the entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. And so Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Notice in verse number 29 as we move through. In the context of the chapter, of course, John has been preaching and the Pharisees and other people say, Who are you? Are you claiming to be the Messiah? He's like, No. Are you claiming to be Elijah? He's like, No, I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. He's out there baptizing people and then Jesus comes. You'll notice in verse number 28, John's baptized in verse 29, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of, sin of the world. Notice Jesus Christ is not only the light, He is the Lamb. 
He's the life, He's the light, He's the Lamb of God. Now this concept goes all the way back to the Passover. Really it goes back further than that. If you know your Bible, when Adam and Eve sinned, they hid from God. And the Bible says that God called unto Adam, says, Where art thou? And the Bible says that Adam and his wife had made fig leaves to cover up. And God said, The fig leaves aren't going to do. So he took an animal and he covered them. But what he did is he covered them with skins. They tried to cover up in their own self-righteousness. They went to the sewing factory of religion and they tried to cover up. And the Lord said, that ain't going to work. So he got a, a lamb and the first time blood was shed, God had to shed that blood in behalf of sinful man. That's where that thing goes back to. And then that thing begins to be passed on. That idea of a sacrificial animal is passed on from Adam to his son Abel. And Abel brings of the flocks. He brings a, a lamb. And he sacrifices that and God has respect to Abel and to his offering. Cain brings a turnip, you know, and cuts it up and can't get blood out of it. <laughs> and so religion does not bring you close to God. It takes a relationship through blood. And then that concept's carried over in the Passover lamb when Moses has the children of Israel in Egypt. And how are they going to break the, sh the stranglehold of Pharaoh and the chains of Egypt? It's by the power of the blood of the sacrif sacrificial lamb. And he says, you need to go get a lamb. You need to get the lamb. And you need, need to get your lamb. The thing is, you read it in Exodus chapter 12, there's a progress there. And it's got to be personal. Your lamb. And they're delivered out of Egypt by way of the sacrificial blood of the Lamb. And then all the Old Testament sacrifices speak of this. They can't take away sin. It takes the sinless blood of Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God. You'll notice the phrase. Notice in verse number 29, Behold the Lamb of God, look at it, which taketh away the sin of the world. When you compare that to Hebrews, you see the difference. In Hebrews, the Bible says it's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away Sin. In other words, sins were forgiven in the Old Testament because of those animal sacrifices. God told them, you need to do this and I'll forgive you, but their sins weren't taken away. It's one thing to be forgiven. It's another thing to have your sin removed. It's like this. You go and you commit a crime against society. They say, okay, you've got to pay the fine. Spend 10 days in jail. Okay, you pay your fine. You spend 10 days in jail. That thing is written down. It's in the books. You did it. You paid your fine. You're out and you're done, but it's not erased. When you trust Christ as Savior, this is what happened. You're justified by faith in His blood. So what that means is you're justified as if you... It's just as if you had never sinned. He removes the penalty and He removes... It's just as if you had lived a sinless life. That's the power of the forgiveness of God. So it's not just that you've been forgiven of the trespass, like many people are forgiven of a trespass. Somebody can come up to you and they can do wrong to you. Somebody can come up and say, you know what? It was me that stole your car and I went and sold it. Yeah, and I, you know, will you forgive me? Yeah, I'll forgive you. It was only a $25,000 car, but I'll forgive you. Okay, that's a pretty nice guy. <laughs> um, you might forgive, but I guarantee you're not going to let him. You know, he comes up two days later, hey, can I borrow your car? <laughs> That's not going to happen. You might forgive, but you are not going to forget. The Bible says, when you trust Christ, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions. So there's a clearing, there's a redemption. In whom we have redemption, Colossians 1.14, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So he's the Lamb of God that taketh away. So that's his identity. Revelation chapter 5, I'll read this to you. Briefly, and I'll move on about the Lamb of God. Revelation chapter 5, in verse number 6, I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beast and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by Thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. 
And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of angels. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. He's the Lamb of God. When you read Revelation, it's amazing because you read this phrase, the wrath of the Lamb. That's kind of weird, isn't it? You think about a lamb being docile and you, you, know, you, you make funny noise at a lamb and he realizes you're not the shepherd and he turns around and goes off. You think about the wrath of a lamb? That's only used of Jesus Christ because he is the Lamb of God and his blood is shed for sinners. But there also is the other side of that, he, the wrath of the lamb to those who will not take his payment for sin. His identity and his, attention, his intention was to take, and he did, the sin of the world. The biggest problem we have is sin, and he took care of that. One more thing here. Come back to John chapter number 1, and we'll look at Jesus Christ toward the end of the chapter. What happens, John preaches again the next day, and there are two of John's disciples there that hear John preach. And, and Jesus comes again, and he points him out again and says, Behold the Lamb of God. Look at it in verse number uh, 35 and 36. Two of the disciples, verse 37, heard him speak and they followed Jesus. So you have uh, two disciples. You have Andrew and uh, Simon Peter's brother following. And so what happens is, and then you have, notice down in verse 44, you have Philip. So you have Andrew and you have Philip. And Philip wants to go get his brother and Andrew goes and gets his brother. So these two guys, the first thing they think is we've got to get our brothers and tell them. Of course, all four of these guys had already been previously followers of John the Baptist. All of Jesus' twelve disciples were first disciples of John. You understand that. However, notice he goes to Nathaniel here. Philip goes to Nathaniel and he says, we found him, verse number 45. Nathanael says, verse 46, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Nathanael is an honest skeptic. And I say honest because when he comes to Jesus, Jesus says, Do you believe? And he goes, I don't know. And he goes, I saw you when you were back under that fig tree. He's like, How did you do that? This is back before they had drones, you know. People spying on you in your backyard, you know, whatever. You know, I saw you next door, you know. Well, you probably did. You probably... You know, put a camera in there or something crazy. Anyway, he's like, there's no way you could have done that. You must be the Son of God. He believed just like that. If someone's an honest skeptic, when God gives them reasonable proof... I mean, the Lord is not an unreasonable God. He says, come now, Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And he says over in Acts chapter number 1, when he rose again from the dead, there are many infallible proofs. He appeared to 500 people at one time. He rose again from the dead. That's a historical event. And so he gives the Bible, he gives all of this proof to help you in your intellectual doubt. And he says, if you're honest, you'll believe. And Nathaniel says, I believe it. But notice the statement he makes here. Verse number 50. Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now that reference goes back to Genesis 28. We won't turn to it. But that's a reference to Jacob's ladder. You know the story when Jacob's leaving Bethel, where he comes to Bethel there, he sits there and he puts up some stones for his pillow, and he sees this vision of these angels going up and down into heaven. And he says, if the Lord blesses me and I come back here, I'll give a tenth of everything I have. And he pours, pours oil out on the rock. And that's a reference to that. The idea I just want to draw from that is verse 51. Jesus is the ladder. We're keeping all these L's, right? So we have, I'm quizzing you here. He's the life. He's the light. He's the lamb. He's the ladder. And so you have the way to heaven is Jesus Christ. Real simple. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so when you think about this, you think about Christ as being the way. 
he presents himself to Nathaniel, the skeptic, and he gives reason to believe. And I'm glad we do not have some type of religion that's asking us to drink the Kool-Aid. I mean, look, I am a skeptic by nature. I doubt myself all, a lot of times. I, I just, uh, I guess it's a fault. I am skeptical to a fault. And sometimes you have to be real careful with that because the Holy Spirit will impress you with certain things. Then you say, is that the Lord or is that me? Is that the Lord or is that the devil? And then you start going back and forth. Here's a good thing. If it doesn't contradict the Bible, why don't you step out by faith and just be obedient? Now, if it's contradicting the Bible, you better listen to check out what voice you're listening to. So how do I know? You need to start reading the Bible. Fill yourself with the Scriptures and get to know the God of the Bible, not just the God of who you think God is. And fill your heart with the Bible and that will lead you. So Jesus Christ is the way. Nathaniel believes. He settles that problem. The only way up is through Jesus Christ. So the only way to fellowship is through Jesus Christ. And notice also there's a second Advent reference here. Because when Jesus returns, He returns with those glorious angels we read about in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Now I want to close just really this Bible study about Jesus. Jesus Christ is... I mean, really, you just think about that statement. You could stop it like that because He is. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus Christ is. If you ever heard of S.M. Lockridge, he was a great preacher years ago, a black preacher, pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in San Diego from 53 to 93. He died back in 2000. I think S.M., I don't know if it was true, I heard, him, I heard a, re, a tape of him preaching. He said that, that stood for Shadrach, Meshach. And I don't know if it, really, if it really did or not. I don't know if I just always see S.M. Lockridge. But he preached a sermon titled, He's My King. I want to read it to you. I'm not going to do it justice like this man would preach. This man was a preaching machine, if you've ever heard a tape of him preaching. Jesus Christ, He is my King. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. He's God's Son. He's a sinner's Savior. He's a centerpiece of civilization. He stands alone in Himself. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest idea in philosophy. He's the fundamental truth in theology. He's the miracle of the age. He's the only one able to supply all of our needs simultaneously. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and He saves. He guards and He guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He beautifies the meek. Do you know Him? Well, my King is the King of knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. He's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and His burden is light. Well, I wish I could describe Him to you, but He's indescribable. Yes, He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. I'm trying to tell you the heavens cannot contain Him, let alone a man explain Him. You can't get Him out of your mind. You can't get Him off your hands. You can't outlive Him and you can't live without Him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. He's always been, and he always will be. 
I'm talking about he who had no predecessor and he who has no successor. There was nobody before him and there will be nobody after him. You can't impeach him and he's not going to resign. <laughs> we'll try to get prestige and honor and glory to ourselves, but the glory is all his. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. How long is that? And ever and ever and ever and ever. And when you get through with all the forevers, then, amen. Oh, I wish I could describe him to you. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is. I'm glad he's my Savior. And in the midst of the panic, in the midst of the pandemonium, we have to realize he is our peace. If you have Jesus Christ, that's all you need. So let's be in prayer. And let's also make sure we stay focused on our Savior, Jesus Christ, as we go through times like these. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the Scriptures. Lord, just a small Bible study, but some...